brief but severe pain in the chin, cheek, or forehead, often triggered by touching the face, shaving, putting on makeup, even talking or eating. Electric, sharp, often excruciating pain. These are classic symptoms of trigeminal neuralgia, but there are many treatment options you can discuss with your own provider, and I have some timestamps and references below. Let's have some fun. Pain in trigeminal neuralgia comes from the trigeminal nerve or fifth cranial nerve which arises from the pons in the brainstem and has three major sensory branches, the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular branch, which is why pain is usually localized to one of these three areas. There are many other causes of facial pain such as dental problems or trigeminal autonomic cephalgia, so self-diagnose at your own risk. But if you have pain triggered by a very superficial light touch or if you have a refractory period, in other words immunity to pain after an attack, that's supports the diagnosis of trigeminal neuralgia. In so-called classic trigeminal neuralgia, a blood vessel lies in close proximity to the trigeminal nerve, and as the heart beats, it irritates the nerve, causing the protective myelin sheath to wear down over time, making the nerve dysfunctional over time and prone to neuropathic pain. Sometimes an abnormal blood vessel, in particular a branch of the superior cerebellar artery, can form a vascular loop irritating the nerve. There are also secondary causes of trigeminal neuralgia, such as multiple sclerosis, a lesion in the pons or near the exit of the fifth cranial nerve root can be seen sometimes, and rarely we could see a tumor in the area or other lesions such as an arteriovenous malformation, but many times the cause is idiopathic or unknown. This diagram shows classic trigeminal neuralgia with a blood vessel in close proximity to the trigeminal nerve irritating the nerve, and sometimes we can see this on MRI. This is a T2 axial MRI of the brain stem, and you can see the pons, and a blood vessel in very close proximity to the trigeminal nerve, and sometimes a T2 axial fiesta MRI can show an otherwise invisible vascular loop, and surgeons who perform microvascular decompression, which I'll discuss later, often report an aberrant blood vessel even if the MRI appeared to be normal. This is an example of a T1 axial MRI with contrast showing a tumor, a meningioma, in close proximity to that trigeminal nerve in the cerebellar pontine angle. And this is why we do recommend an MRI in people with trigeminal neuralgia, although serious findings like this are rare. This is an example of multiple sclerosis, a T2 flare MRI showing a multiple sclerosis plaque in the lateral pons and cerebellar pontine angle. And and this is associated with trigeminal neuralgia. You can see it on coronal views here as well. Some people have infrequent attacks of TN and don't desire any treatment, but for people with more frequent attacks that are debilitating, there are many prescription medications available. And the most commonly used drug is carbamazepine or Tegretol, which is a decades old treatment that has a long safety history. The typical dose is 100 to 600 milligrams twice daily, and it works by blocking voltage gated sodium channels involved in nerve pain transfer. Transmission. This drug is approved for treating partial epilepsy, so people take it for years or decades, and at low doses, 1 to 200 milligrams twice daily, people tolerate it really well, but at higher doses, it can cause dizziness, imbalance, and vertigo. It also has a side effect of sometimes causing low blood sodium and lowering of the white blood cells, and so blood tests after starting the medication are recommended. There's also a very rare allergy causing rash and sometimes rash even of the mucus membranes known as Stevens-Johnson syndrome, which could be serious and even life-threatening, and if it occurs, the drug should be stopped immediately. This is actually more common in people with a specific gene of the major histocompatibility complex called HLA-B1502, which is more common in people of Han Chinese descent, and it can actually be tested by a simple laboratory test, although this is not routinely done. There are many studies on carbamazepine. This is a 1966 randomized trial of carbamazepine versus placebo in trigeminal neuralgia, and you can see the results of carbamazepine on the left and placebo on the right, and you're looking at the percentages of improvement of different areas. So in terms of severity of pain, people taking the drug improve 58% of the time versus 26% of people taking placebo. 
In terms of number of attacks, it was reduced in 68% of people taking the drug versus 26% in placebo, and provocation by various factors were also improved by the drug, such as eating, talking, contact with the face, and so forth. So carbamazepine definitely is effective in many people. Another seizure medication, oxcarbazepine or trileptol, which is very similar to carbamazepine, is also used for trigeminal neuralgia, and it has exactly the same side effects except that low blood sodium is more common, but low white blood cells is less common. And in two randomized controlled trials, 88% achieve reduction in attacks by greater than 50%, which is pretty good, although sometimes these drugs lose their effect over time. Another medication, gabapentin or Neurontin, which is usually used for other forms of neuropathy pain, such as painful diabetic neuropathy, is also used, and it's well tolerated at lower doses, but at higher doses it can cause side effects such as fatigue or swelling of the ankles, and rarely an allergic side effect angioedema, which is swelling of the lips and tongue, which is potentially dangerous, but it's a relatively safe medication. This is an analysis of two open-label studies of gabapentin in one of the studies with five participants. All five had excellent improvement in symptoms. In another study with 13 participants, five of the six who previously did not receive any other treatment had an excellent or good response. However, for those who received carbamazepine, Tegretol, in the past, only four or of seven had an excellent or good response. So it's less effective in people who previously failed other medications. Various other medications have been used, including phenytoin or dilantin, which is an old seizure medication, lamotrigine or lamictal, often used to treat mood disorders. It's very well tolerated, though it can also cause Steven Johnson syndrome. Pregabalin or Lyrica is very similar to gabapentin and has essentially the same side effects. Topiramate or Topamax, which is approved to treat seizures and headaches, it can cause side effects such as tingling and kidney stones rarely. Valproate or Depakote probably wouldn't be a first line option because it can cause side effects such as weight gain and birth defects. Unfortunately, medications don't work for everyone. The effect can wear off over time or some people have too many side effects, but luckily there's some procedures that can treat trigeminal neuralgia, and one of them is called rhizotomy, or local destruction of the trigeminal nerve. And the basic way it works is a needle is inserted through the cheek and through a hole in the skull called the foramen ovale, leading to that trigeminal nerve root. And you can damage the nerve in multiple ways. The most common is probably radiofrequency thermocoagulation, but you can also inflate a balloon to crush the nerve, and sometimes a nerve toxin called glycerol is used to damage the nerve. And this damages the nerve and causes numbness and hopefully alleviates pain. And it's actually possible with some of these procedures, such as radiofrequency thermocoagulation or ballooning, to damage a selective part of the nerve that is contributing to the pain. For instance, if you have pain in the chin, the V3 or mandibular portion of the nerve can be selectively damaged. And this is important because the procedure can cause numbness, which is normal, but sometimes people can get pain as associated with a numbness called anesthesia dolorosa or a burning uncomfortable pain. So some people get rid of one pain and cause another. And if you have damage to the ophthalmic portion of the nerve, you can actually get numbness of the cornea and impair the normal protective reflexes of the cornea and get secondary corneal injury. However, the treatment is quite effective. The probability of being pain free after one year based on various studies is 68 to 85 percent. However, it becomes less effective effective over time. So after three years, it's about 54 to 64% effective and about 50% effective after five years. However, it works right away. People often have pain relief immediately after the procedure, and it can be used for any cause of trigeminal neuralgia, whether it's due to multiple sclerosis or vascular loop or idiopathic. This should work for everyone with trigeminal neuralgia. And this is a fluoroscopic image of the procedure being performed. You can see the probe through the frame and ovale and and you can see the balloon being inflated to damage the trigeminal ganglion. And this is technically difficult, though it's not blind. It's being done with fluoroscopic imaging to confirm the location of the probe. A different way to damage the nerve is with focused radiation therapy. And there are different ways to do this, but the most common is gamma knife radio surgery. And 70 to 90 gray of radiation are delivered to the proximal trigeminal nerve root. And it is effective, but pain relief is often delayed by one month or sometimes even longer. However, it does work. Complete pain relief was reported in 69% receiving the procedure at one year, but it becomes less effective over time as the nerve recovers, and it was only 52% effective
active at three years. And this is my clinical experience that often the nerve pain comes back over time, especially in people who have had the disorder for a long time. But it's a good option for people who don't want an invasive procedure or if people are taking blood thinning medications or have other contraindications to procedures. This is an image of someone undergoing stereotactic gamma knife radiation. And this is the Novalis face mask, which can also be used to keep the head still so the radiation is delivered right at the trigeminal nerve, maybe not the best for people who are claustrophobic. Now, the most aggressive but often the most effective treatment in the long run is an open surgical procedure called MVD, or microvascular decompression. Now, this is only going to be used for people with classic trigeminal neuralgia, where a blood vessel is irritating the nerve. It's probably not going to be effective for people with multiple sclerosis, but even if the MRI looks normal, many surgeons report that a blood vessel is often there and irritating the nerve, and often an indentation on the nerve can be seen. So basically, an open surgery is performed where a hole is made in the skull and the aberrant blood vessel is identified, separated from the trigeminal nerve, and a pad is inserted between the blood vessel and the nerve so the nerve can repair over time. And it's reported to be 90% effective up front, but long-term remission may be less, maybe 50 to 70%, depending on the case series. My experience is very good with these procedures. Most of my patients did have long-term remission. The annual recurrence rate of pain after the procedure is reported to be about 3.5%. Of course, this is a surgery, and complications can include numbness of the face, infection of the meninges or meningitis, or even a spinal fluid leak, or sometimes injury to other nearby cranial nerves, such as the facial nerve causing facial weakness or hearing loss. This is an intraoperative video of a microvascular decompression. You can see the superior cerebellar artery pulsating and irritating the trigeminal nerve. The surgeon will separate the artery from the nerve and then place a Teflon pad in to protect the nerve from future irritation from the artery. The side effects of the different interventional treatments were analyzed in this meta-analysis of 14 trials with a total of 2,785 treatments, and they're color-coded. You can see in white are the rhizotomy treatments, also known as percutaneous gessarian lesions. In black is microvascular decompression, the open surgery, and in green is gamma knife surgery. And you can see that the gamma knife surgery, the radiation treatment, is really the safest, mainly just causes numbness of the face. And the surgery, coded in black, has the more serious complications such as meningitis or cerebral spinal fluid leak or injuries to the brain or cranial nerves, but they're fairly rare. And you can see that the radiofrequency rhizotomy treatments or other rhizotomy treatments cause a lot of numbness, very high rate of numbness, which is normal. And sometimes other complications such as pain, anesthesia dolorosa, corneal numbness, and the things that I mentioned before. Now, this is a meta-analysis looking at different studies comparing radiofrequency rhizotomy against open surgery, microvascular decompression. And this is a forest plot, and you can see the different studies studies all favor microvascular decompression as having a lower probability of requiring a second procedure, on average a 67% lower chance of needing a second procedure in the long run. And not all of these studies were statistically significant, but if you take them all together, they strongly show that open surgery, microvascular decompression, is the most effective. Also, there was a lower risk of facial numbness with the open surgery, and that makes sense because you're not really damaging you the nerve, you're just sort of moving the artery out of the way. However, there was a greater risk of side effects, adverse events with the open surgery. So it's more effective in the long run, but has a greater risk, particularly when you're talking about risk of serious complications. And some people aren't a great candidate for the surgery in general. And if you have any further questions, please post in the comments below. And if you have tried geminal neuralgia, and if you tried some treatments or others that I didn't mention here, please share your own experience and let me know if you have any suggestions for future videos.